Hi, we've had another delivery from JLC PCB and this time it's the full size NTP clock. So this is the one with the LED matrix at the bottom as you can see. This board is looking pretty good, it's really quite a monster. Uh, but yeah, everything looks alright, so we're going to give this a little try shortly. I didn't quite get to spend as much time as I wanted to on these projects this week, so the ventilator shortage uh, in the UK and actually across the world is uh, meaning that a lot of engineering companies are working hard to create new designs for ventilators that can be rapidly manufactured, and that's been taking up a huge amount of my time recently. Um, so I should be able to get some more work done in the next few weeks, but for now... What we should be able to do is just get the ESP32 mounted on here and hopefully load the same firmware on and this one should work exactly the same as the red one that we looked at last week. Let's have a little closer look at the PCB. You'll notice that two of the parts didn't get placed. Unfortunately, they were out of stock when the actual PCB order went through, uh, but I've got some of those in stock so we can solder those on. Here we have the footprint for the ESP32. And what we've got is a series resistor in line with every GPIO pin on the controller so that if we do have any troubles with the ESP32 driving that entire matrix, what we can do is just lift that resistor as needed and tack on another board on the back of the PCB connected to these points around the ESP32. So if we absolutely need to, we could put something like a PIC24 or a PIC32 on the back of the PCB and just join it in to these various points. Now these actually have the right diameter so that when we've got our scope probe we can actually just poke them in there and it holds them really quite tightly. So these are a little bit smaller than your normal test points but uh, it provides good accessibility both for the scope probes and also for any pins that we might want to stick on there uh, to modify the PCB. Here we have the anode drivers again and I forgot to mention last time I did want to thank those that pointed out that the MOSFETs that I'd chosen had a VGS maximum voltage of 12 volts, but I was actually driving the LED lines up to a maximum of 16 volts. So I would have destroyed these MOSFETs had I omitted these additional Zener diodes, which are clamping the gate voltage uh, to something a bit more reasonable. Here we have some of the new circuitry. So there's 16 rows in the LED matrix. So what we've got is 16 anode drivers, so 16 transistors, that are being driven by the demultiplexers that haven't been fitted but will be fitted up here. And then those drive some MOSFETs along the side of the LEDs. I've just twisted the PCB 90 degrees, so here are the MOSFETs for the LED matrix. These are dual MOSFETs, so actually each package can drive two rows. For some reason I omitted a couple of capacitors here, I'm not sure what happened, but I think we'll be okay. And then we've got the LED matrix itself. Here we have the LEDs and this time we've gone for white LEDs across the board. They look yellow, that's just the phosphor on the LED and the thinking behind it is by having white LEDs with quite a large phosphor area, the emissive area is going to be larger and it will look a little bit less pixelated when we've got text being displayed on the LEDs. But you can see we've just got tons and tons of LEDs. That's 1,280 LEDs, 80 columns and 16 rows and then at the bottom of the PCB is where we've got the drivers so each column has one NPN transistor at the bottom here some current setting resistors all the way along the bottom and then the base resistors which go to the 74HC595 shift registers. At the very bottom of the PCB, we've got the power supply circuitry. So we've got the XL Semi XL6019, which is our 16 volt boost converter for the LEDs on the clock face. This is what we used in the previous design. Uh, so we know that this part of the circuitry works well. What's new in this design is the 6.5 volt supply for the LEDs in the LED matrix. So this is using an LM2596 simple switcher. This is just a buck converter. It should work quite nicely, uh, but we will give this a quick test in this video to make sure that's all working properly. And then instead of the 5 volt regulator, this just goes to some more capacitors. And then at the top of the PCB is our linear regulator just to provide power for the ESP32. Now I did have a question previously about whether one of these small SOT23 packages was fine for the ESP32 and it absolutely is. So 
the peak current that I saw being drawn from the ESP32 is about 120 milliamps when Wi-Fi was occurring and it was doing some transmission. So well within the capability of a fairly small 3.3 volt linear regulator. Right, so we've got 12 volt applied to the PCB. Let's just double check that. 11.93. So let's have a little look at the voltage rails. Now I think I modified the LED supply from 16 to about 15 volts just to reduce the dissipation in the transistors a little bit. So let's have a look at that. 14.83. So yeah, that's plenty for that. Let's see if the book regulator is working okay. 6.422. So yeah, well within spec. And then finally the 3.3 volt supply up at the top, 3.306. So that appears to be okay. Let's try putting the firmware on from before. And so the firmware seems to work absolutely fine on this board. This is the Room 32D version of the ESP32. But yeah, these white LEDs are significantly brighter than the red LEDs that we used last time. Same input power pretty much, so we're drawing about 500 milliamps from the 12 volt supply. So we're putting in about six watts at the moment. It slowly creeps up as we get further along and add more LEDs on around the outside. But yeah, this is really very bright and uh, yeah, really quite visually pleasing. The idea is that this will have a smoked Perspex panel over the front uh, to give a little bit better contrast against the green PCB. Let's have a little look at the uh, 16 volts, well the 15 volt supply, just see if that is dropping at all with the additional load. And it would just be as it rolls over here that it might drop. And no, it's pretty much rock solid, so that's really good. That seems to be working quite well. I've never used one of the XL Semi DC to DC converters but it does just seem to work, so quite happy with how that's looking. Now one thing that I'm seeing, other than a little bit of ghosting on some of these LEDs, so I may need to change the blanking period between the multiplexing stages, but these LEDs have a really wide viewing angle, much wider than the red LEDs. The consequence is, if you have a look, you can see that the ESP32 is lit up quite brightly. We've got the light sensor up here, and what I'm seeing is the intensity of the display is actually going up and down because the light sensor is actually being self-illuminated by the LEDs around here. So when these LEDs around here start to light up, the whole display suddenly starts to get brighter because it's lighting it up. So I think what we're going to need is some kind of shroud around that light sensor so that it doesn't pick up light from these LEDs. If I put a bit of blue tack around it to shield it, you can see how much light is getting all the way over here, uh, but it stops it waving up and down. Now oddly you can see the ghosting changes once we get to around here. They suddenly turn off at that point and then they follow these LEDs. So I need to have a little look and just check I'm not actually creating a bug in the firmware and that it is just the blanking period. So that's a little look at where we're at with the larger version of the NTP clock and I think it looks really good with the white LEDs. I think I actually prefer this to the red. And I think it'll look even better once we've got the smoked acrylic over the front. It should give it a nice crisp look. What I'm hoping to get done next is multiplexing the display at the bottom. And what I want on here is the date information and then possibly something like the weather. So we'll use the ESP32 to grab the weather data and then maybe uh, have some graphics for the type of weather that we're experiencing. Uh, something like that. If you've got any suggestions, then obviously leave it in the comments down below. I've not really thought much past having the time and date. I did have a question in the comments previously about whether I was actually going to sell these PCBs. Now, what I'm going to do is upload all of the files to the website, including the firmware when it's finished, so that you can build your own, but I'm probably not going to order them in and then sell them individually. Uh, there is an option at JLC PCB to only assemble two PCBs out of the five that you have ordered. Uh, but I think given the cost, I think this came in at $350 for all five boards fully assembled. I mean, that's super reasonable. The board itself, four layer board, which is uh, bigger than A4 paper. I think these were about, uh, all five were about $75, something like that. And then the rest is assembly and components. 
And if you think about it, there's uh, almost 3,000 components on this PCB. Trying to assemble these by hand, you'd go absolutely nuts, I think. Um, so the cost is actually really quite reasonable. It's not too bad at all, especially when you factor in the cost of the components. To get them to actually pick in place is really, really good value. So hopefully you found the video interesting. If you've got any thoughts or comments, leave them in the comments section down below. But until next time, thanks for watching.